Welcome back. So in this module, we're going to talk about client access services and how do you make that highly available and also focus on site resilience. So uh, client access is really important for your clients to connect to. We've said that a couple of times. And uh, if you want to go into the detail around setting this up, check out the edX course that we uh, mentioned in the beginning of this course. But uh, in terms of high availability for client access services, the number one thing that's really important to stress is namespace planning. Namespace planning allows you to set up your exchange connection points for clients. This is where clients would connect to. Even with auto discover, namespace planning is a really important part. And then site resilience, how do you fail over to another site and make that available to a, another site is as part of that other side of the coin of making exchange highly available even if a data center fails or something like that. So uh, when it comes to namespace planning, we have a couple of options. The one option is to have a, a bound model or unbound model. And we're going to go into the details of what a bound model versus a unbound model means. Uh, we also have the Office Online Server namespace that you have to specify. The Office Online namespace is the namespace that is advertised to uh, Outlook on the web so that it can do the rendering of documents when people want to view documents inside of Outlook on the web. And in fact, that name uh, or that um, display is created through iframe inside of Outlook on the web. And if uh, that is not properly published with the, uh, the right namespace, then people will not be able to connect and see uh, the attachments inside of the web browser. You also have to configure internal and external namespaces. Internal namespaces is for clients that are connected internally and other servers to connect to the exchange servers. But So you have to set those properly to make sure that uh, you can advertise that via auto discover to the clients and they can do the right thing when they connect it internally inside of your organization. And then uh, you also uh, optionally, if you're, um, it's required, you can set up regional namespaces so that uh, people connect to the right region and they are closer to their mailboxes when they uh, connect to exchange servers. So namespace planning, uh, in Exchange 2016, it's no longer needed to have a lot of namespaces that was required in 2010. In 2010, there was so many namespaces that was needed because of a legacy requirements. Say you had old versions of Exchange in your environment. You had to create this legacy namespace to redirect users to that legacy namespace. Uh, now, you um, only have to have the namespaces that you're going to uh, make available to your users to connect to. And those could be 2013 servers or it could be 2016 servers because the 2013 servers can, what they call, up proxy to 2016 servers. You can connect via 2013 server to a 2016 server. That scenario works fine. Uh, the client access service only does a proxy in that um, case. Uh, for 2010 servers, obviously if you have 2010 servers in your environment, the 2010 servers cannot up proxy to 2016 servers. So you need to um, replace your 2016 servers or your 2010 servers with 2016 servers so that uh, they can down proxy to 2010 servers. So it's important to remember that uh, if you still have 2010 servers in your environment, that you have, um, that you replace the internet facing servers first. With the namespace models, you can deploy either a bound model or an unbound model. And uh, I'll run through an example of the differences between those two. Uh, you can still have uh, regional namespaces to control traffic. So if you have a European data center and you want people to connect to a European namespace there and not connect all the way to North America and then back to servers uh, in uh, the European data center, you know, it, like that would be inefficient. Um, so then you would have a internet facing site in Europe and make that namespace available to users and then 
they will connect to that directly, which will then connect to local mailbox servers in that region. Uh, you can still have specific namespaces for certain protocols, uh, like a POP3 namespace or a O1 namespace and so on. But it's really not necessary because one namespace can serve all of those protocols and uh, client access services will just proxy the right protocol to the backend and, and make that available. Uh, we'd still recommend that you leverage a split DNS to minimize namespace planning so that you don't have a specific internal name. So if your namespace is mail.adatum.com, then that resolves internally to a load balancer that is available internally with uh, load balance IP addresses, uh, internable, internable routable names, versus uh, if you have the same name externally, it resolves to a name that is a external IP address and then comes via your perimeter network. If you don't have a split DNS uh, infrastructure and people resolve that name, it would mean that they connect to your perimeter network and back in and that would be inefficient again. So a split DNS um, mechanism allows you to uh, let clients connect directly to the systems using internal IP addresses or external IP addresses. So um, here's an example of a bound model of exchange. And so in this case, we have um, two database availability groups. Uh, uh, there's a West uh, virtual IP and an East virtual IP. Um, so two different uh, IPs and let's say this is the West Coast and the East Coast. And uh, we have these stretch database availability groups. And in a bound model, say Sue is somewhere in North America and her mailbox is in uh, the West Coast, uh, she would then use the name of the uh, bound model. So in this case, it's bound by that region, west at contorso.com. That would connect to a, a load balancer, which, which will then connect to any server as part of that database availability group. And obviously, client access service would just redirect to the right mailbox server that's hosting the mailbox database. Um, and then a, another user somewhere else in the organization, if that user connects to the right mailbox at, um, on the other side, it will then connect to the server on the other side, uh, just like that. But if that user is um, in the wrong place, then um, he would always connect to the URL that is closest to his mailbox. So it's almost like a regional model. In an unbound model, it works a little bit differently because now you just have one name and that one name then allows people to connect to that name, uh, to that uh, endpoint and then that endpoint doesn't really know where your mailbox is and it will then resolve based on criteria that you need to uh, specify. Some organizations would use a global DNS system that gives back an IP address based on your location. So that's uh, uh, GeoDNS, uh, some, uh, sometimes it's called. When it's using that, it will say, oh, you are currently in the West Coast, so I'm going to give you the VIP that's on the West Coast. And so it will then decide between those two. That's one option, or it can say can any... Do a round robin. A round robin between yeah. them. Um, say it's uh, connecting to the right side, you're in luck. So now it connects to a server that is in the right site, and it will then just uh, proxy that request to a server on, on that side. So, so what happens if one of those sites go down? If, if one of those sites goes down and the global um, DNA system uh, is aware of that site, then uh, it can connect you to the other site. But in most of the cases, it's not uh, because it's not intelligent enough to know if it's down. And the good thing about HTTP is because it's round robin, it gave the client two IP addresses and the client will say, oh, I'm going to try the other IP address. And so then it will connect to the other VIP and, and connect to the mailbox. And it can connect even using the, still the same DNS name. Yes, so it's unbound, it's not bound to any region. So in, in this other case, we uh, the, this user resolved a name that's uh, in uh, via a VIP 
a virtual IP that's in another site and that connected to a client access service in on that other site and it saw, oh, this user is actually on the other site and it just proxied that request to the mailbox server on the other site and retrieved the information. So in uh, that is really the difference between the, client, the, the bound model and the unbound model. The bound model you have regional namespaces uh, or, or namespaces that is associated with user and users need to know those things. And in the unbound model, you only have one namespace that people connect to. And uh, the beauty of HTTP, DNS, and also uh, load balancing, make sure that you, you always get back to the where the server is and the mailbox server. So, so from a best, best practices perspective, uh, would it be safe to say that for Exchange, and in a site resilient solution, where you have two sites or more sites, uh, you would use an unbound model mm -hmm. because you, we prefer, you know, with uh, uh, making things simple and a simple single namespace. Uh, and then with your office online servers, you're going to use a bound model. Yeah, because with um, your offline address, oh, sorry, your um, your office online servers. Um, those are not uh, aware of this features that is available in Exchange where it can just proxy back to the right place. So you need to have a bound model yep. and associate your offline, um, sorry, your online, office online <laughs> service uh, to, to, uh, with specific sites. So um, this allows you to set up site resiliency very easily for client access services. Um, but you still have to configure your internal and external URLs for multiple sites in some cases so that um, those uh, addresses are given to the users properly and they, uh, when they connect to Outlook and there's some sort of failure that they will be able to resolve those names and connect to the other site automatically. Yeah. So that's, that's a good point that needs to be mentioned is that when you install Exchange, the internal URLs are, are set for you. Yeah, but the uh, values for the external URLs are null. So whether you're in a single site or a multiple multiple site, like we're talking about now, mm -hmm. those external ne URLs need to be set, usually to the um, to common name that's on the certificate that you're using on your uh, internet-facing servers. Yeah, so that's a good tip. So if you forget to set those things, then you're not going to see the expected behavior for clients when they're on the internet and, and trying to resolve those names. Um, so you need to set those values as part of your initial exchange configuration of those external URLs. Uh, when you set up exchange in an unbound model properly, then the file over switch is really automatic uh, because DNS will help you do that resolution, get you to the other side, uh, make sure that it works. But there might be other things that you need to do to make sure that your failover to the other site is working properly. If you have servers in another site and it's part of a database availability group and so on, then there's databases that need to fail over. And it's not part of this course, but client access services is that uh, HTTP protocol, um, it's really easy to fail over and so on. But um, it, just remember that it's part of a bigger thing that you may have to implement and make sure that it works well in your environment before uh, you have real uh, site resiliency. So uh, that wraps up our Exchange Server 2016 Client Access Services course. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this. Uh, we are um, also doing a course on mailbox and transport. Uh, stick around and uh, tune in for those as well. And uh, if you want to go into more detail around these things, do some labs on Client Access Services, then uh, check out the link at the beginning of this course on the edX course for client access services for Exchange Server 2016. Thank you.